refugees languishing at home. The Irish word for emigrant, Jory, holds within its teardrop meaning a tide of sorrow which has carried away a million hearts. As they set sail across the Atlantic, the last visible bit of Ireland fading into the grey was Fastnet Rock. For those who were able to return, it emerged as the first tangible sign of home. As one saying goes, the times they are a-changing. The wild geese return along the beckoning beacon of better times, or never have to go away at all. For centuries, the most settled part of Ireland was England's very limited bridgehead, the Pale, part of the province of Leinster, and the only place the Crown's writ ran freely. Here, the organizing flair of the Norman invaders introduced religious orders from the continent, Cistercians, Augustinians. Man's interaction with his fate and his attempts to divine powers beyond his daily existence here go back beyond the Great Pyramid of Egypt to Neolithic Newgrange. Here the sun's rays still strike directly into this mounded burial chamber at each dawn of the winter solstice. The cycle of birth and death and the rhythm of the year's work was settled and celebrated in rituals that still retain their mystery. These are sacred lands, recognized as such by successive cultures. The high kings at Tara held annual festivals and claimed a wary allegiance from minor kings and chieftains. The old Irish ballad, The Rocky Road to Dublin, is now a tuneful counterpoint to the city's high-speed connections. Dublin's tempo is ever quickening. Europe's chattering classes and culture vultures have made it an essential stage on their grand tour.
From the gardens of Stevens Green to the Temple Bar District, Dublin's new Bohemian Left Bank, you may still meet a friend, an enemy, or a bore round every bend. But Dublin's wit and repartee leaves as little bitterness as you'll find at the bottom of a glass of Guinness. The Ascendancy, founders of the great houses in Ireland, have a mixed reputation. Their contributions to the public and common wealth seldom match the grandeur of their lifestyle. In general, the Anglo-Irish, however, were, in Yeats' words, no mean people. Recurring great names are the Ormond Butlers and the Fitzgeralds, who were the Earls of Kildare and Dukes of Leinster. Their townhouse, now the seat of the Irish Parliament. The Fitzgeralds were once considered the uncrowned kings of Ireland. The one place where the two ends of the social scale met on common ground was at the races. The horse could win a penny or a pound for lord or commoner. The state has inherited and maintains some of the best of the old great houses, where all Ireland citizens can now visit their treasures and take refreshment on the terraces. The Kilkenny cats, in their black and amber stripe, are notable modern exponents of hurling. The game began with a small leather ball being struck by teams from neighboring parishes. The winners being those who, at the end of the day, had penetrated furthest into their opponent's territory. Like diplomacy, it was a more peaceful way to let off steam than the older, murderous faction fights. It was war by other means. The smell of a turf fire is, for Irish people everywhere, a touchstone of memory. The past and the present come together. Where invading Elizabethan armies saw a soggy, savage wilderness where no sensible person would willingly set foot, peat is now milled for the domestic hearth and environment-friendly power stations. Stripping the blanket bog turns back the pages of history, revealing ancient fields and pathways.
There Ben Bulban's head is where jealous Fionn of the warrior Fiona finally cornered young Diarmuid, with whom his queen Gronya had run away. These are heroes of a half-mythical Ireland, which W.B. Yeats invoked to underpin the Republican dreams of his own fickle love, Maud Gon McBride, the subject of so much of his poetry. The Irish state, which made Yeats a senator, was uneasy with the liberal beliefs of this romantic Protestant. But they finally brought him home to rest in Drumcliff Churchyard. Cast a cold eye on life, on death, horsemen pass by. bundled up the clouds over Knock Naray, and thrown the thunder on the stones for all that Maeve can say. The grave cairn of the powerful Queen of Connacht, who led the men of the West into Ulster to steal the brown bull of Cooley. The epic saga has been recited and embellished from ancient times, one of the great treasures of the Irish language. Like ancient ruins, towering stacks loom off the mainland at Downpatrick Head. Slabs of cliff like Dumbrista, the broken fort, testify to the dangerous coast and treacherous waters. For centuries, smugglers brought contraband goods, brandy and tobacco, ashore in the ports of Ballina and Westport through these ungovernable seas.
Clue Bay's hundred islands lay like green stepping stones in a peaceful sea. But once, they were the domain of traders and raiders, the seafaring O'Malley's. The O'Malley's traded with La Coruna and the ports of northern Spain and exacted tribute on the high seas. Their warrior chief was a woman, a she-king, Gronya O'Malley, Gronya Whale. Her exploits were so cunning, so daring, that she captured the attention of Queen Elizabeth herself, who extended a royal invitation to visit in London. There was a real Patrick who came to Ireland about the middle of the 5th century. Writings like Patrick's breastplate and other records testify to his mission. But other, lesser figures have been subsumed into the mixture of fact and legend surrounding him. Very real is the pain for barefoot pilgrims wending their way through early...